This week at St. John's, we're starting a, a new tradition, or you could say we're adding on to one of the traditions we've had since 1994, and that's our offertory uh, procession. It's preached about last week, as hopefully you saw the video that was sent out this week as well in our weekly update. Uh, we've added a basket, you can tell on your way in, we've added a basket up in front of uh, the sanctuary. And once again, that basket is meant to be used to drop off uh, you could say, or place at the foot of the altar uh, the intention that you're praying for at Mass. Actually, in your pews is, a, is an intention card, so kind of in that slot right there. Now, at the 8 o'clock, someone says, Father, you need to put pencils in the pews. My response was, no. Because all you hear during that time is ding, 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 and it would drive me nuts. So hopefully you have a writing utensil. If not, you can obviously bring the card home this week there's other cards in the back of the church as well, and kind of think about who am I going to pray for at Mass, during Mass, the most beautiful t prayer we can do, and to literally lift them up to the Lord. So we say during the preface, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And so we're bringing our heart to the Lord. So I encourage you during the offertory procession to drop your intention card right there in the center basket. Now maybe you're thinking, Father, I, I just don't, I'm drawing a blank on who to pray for. Also on your way in, there's another basket that people have dropped off intentions throughout the week that they're asking people to pray for. So that basket's in the back of the church as well. And there's already some cards filled out. So maybe, well, not today during this Mass, that'd be very distracting. Uh, but in the future, you can grab one of those intention cards. And once again, we just want to make the Mass even more active participation. So remember, it's not just I who am praying the Mass, but we're gathered together as a community and bringing our sacrifices, bringing our heart before the Lord. So I'm really looking forward uh, to, to this new tradition or revised tradition here at St. John's. Speaking of traditions, by the way, we hear all about traditions in our gospel. It's a little bit confusing gospel at first because what's exactly happening well, the Pharisees, once again, are trying to put Jesus in hot water, trying to trick him. So the Pharisees and scribes come to Jesus and they say to him, how come your disciples, how come you and your disciples don't follow the tradition of the elders in, in, in eating a meal with unclean hands, that you're doing eating a meal with unclean hands? What exactly is going on here? Now remember, we're back in Mark's gospel now. The last five weeks we've been reading John chapter 6, praise God, but now we're back into Mark's gospel. And the beautiful thing about Mark is he actually goes into a lot more details than maybe Matthew or Luke because he's writing not to a Jewish audience, but he's writing to the Romans and the pagans as well. So he kind of explains what a Jewish tradition is from the elders is that the Pharisees and all those who followed the Pharisees, and that was most uh, the Jewish people at the time. We hear about the Sadducees, we hear about the, the Essens, uh, but, but most people are following the Pharisees and, and kind of their, their interpretation of, of the law and, and their traditions as well. Well, the elders of the Pharisees had started this tradition that before you eat, you would purify your hands. Now, yes, we know we should do that as well, right? To have good hygiene, but this wasn't about hygiene. This was more about purifying and so we can be holy in what we receive was kind of the intention there. But it's important to remember, this was a tradition. It wasn't a commandment. And there's a huge difference there. Because the Pharisees are having all these traditions that they're making everyone do and that we know they're not actually following the commandments. That's a big problem. We go back to our first reading today uh, from Deuteronomy. And what does Moses say about the commandments? Well, this is what he says. In your observance of the commandments of the Lord your God, which I enjoin upon you, you shall not add to what I command you, nor subtract from it. But these Pharisees, the elders, are having traditions surpass 
commandments. And in doing so, and actually it would be in Mark chapter 7, and a couple of verses we don't read from Mark chapter 7, uh, 8 through 13, 9 through 13, that Jesus actually uses an example that the Pharisees are having a tradition over suppress the commandment of love your father, honor your father and mother. And so this is a very dangerous territory to be in. And this is what the Pharisees are doing. Their traditions are, in a certain sense, undermining the commandments of the Lord. And so Jesus calls them out on this. He calls them, and this is a big word for Jesus to say, he calls them a hypocrite. He he uses the words from Isaiah. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines human precepts. And we see this over and over and over again, not just with the Pharisees, we see this throughout the the Old Testament, that they're saying we are going to choose the Lord with their lips, but in their heart they're doing something else. Or they're putting on great appearances, but inside they're really far away from the Lord. And even these traditions are taking them away from the Lord. So the crux of the whole gospel comes here from Mark chapter 7, verse 8. You disregard God's commandment, but cling to human tradition. I like the other interpretation for the Rise Standard Version where it says, you leave the commandment of God and hold fast to the tradition of men. Do we fall into that sometimes? Does our religion simply become part of our culture? Do we cling to religious traditions that aren't actually meant to be clung on to and forget about the commandments? This is what the Pharisees were doing. And actually their traditions, once again, are undermining the commandments. What are the commandments? Well, we know the ten great commandments, right? Right? And these Ten Great Commandments are not meant to suppress us. They're meant to help us experience God's love. They're not meant as an optional choice to follow or not. These commandments lead us where? Into union with God. But so often we can have worldly traditions, family traditions, friend traditions, that take us away from truly following God's commandments. I want to use a couple examples real quick. One's a kind of a silly example, and one's a little bit more pastoral. You know, we've begun now the new fall sports season. Uh, The tradition of Minnesota, we know, of course, is always the kickers missing field goals. We got that down already uh, for, for the goal. And we'd say, Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. So it's always very inspiring that we could have all these men, all these not men, all these boys come, come together and invoke Mary's intercession and ask her for victory. Now, we could say she was listening to us because we only lost two games through high school, but I'll be honest, we had Joe Maurer as a quarterback. That's why we only lost uh, two games in high school. But with that, we were always mostly victorious. But we also had another tradition. After every victory... We get on the bus or get back to the locker room and we'd sing some different songs. Now this was not coming from the administration. This wasn't coming from the coaches. It was the elders of teams before us passing on this tradition that we sing these songs, maybe even knocking the team that we, we beat or something. Now praise God, I don't remember these songs, but I do remember this. They weren't edifying God. Probably some inappropriate language in there. And I think back of that, I go, why did I participate in that? Well, it's part of our tradition. This is what we do. No. Because I think back of it now, and it's like, well, no, I did take the Lord's name in vain in doing that. Or I did swear. So how do we justify it? Well, it's part of the team tradition. Hmm. It's kind of a silly example. But maybe you're thinking about yourself right now. Are there other traditions that you just think, oh, we've always done it this way? Really, it's going against the commandments. 
Let's use a more pastoral example we could say. And I remember a time once again, probably in high school, I was with a buddy who went to their cabin. It's up by Hinkley or someplace like that, I'm sure. I said, okay, when are we going to Mass? He goes, well, our family has a tradition. When we go to the cabin, we don't go to Mass. What? But did I have the courage at that time to tell him, well, my family has a tradition, we go to Mass no matter what, unless it's three hours away or something. Like, that'd have to be an extreme example. No, probably I didn't, if looking back to high school. But do we fall into that as well? Of course, great commandment. Keep holy the Sabbath. Come to Mass. And you're here this morning. You know the importance of coming to Mass. But not only here at St. John the Baptist, but when you're traveling as well. And if it's a tradition to say, ah, oh, we take it off when we go on vacation, just remember, traditions are not meant to undercut the commandments of God. You may think, well, Father, this all seems very restrictive. It's not restrictive. God's commandments are a pathway to him. He wants to help us come into union with him and give us all that we need. Now, I'm not saying that we get rid of all traditions, but I am saying we get rid of traditions that undercut God's commandments. We know at the end of the day, the most important person in our life, the most important relationship has to be God. And so we don't cling to traditions. We cling to the commandments, knowing that they're going to lead us into a greater relationship with God.